Amen. Thank you so much. Turn with me to the book of Acts. Let me give you a little bit of an understanding of what's going on tonight. I don't usually tell you this, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway. I do a Bible study, an in-depth Bible study, obviously on Wednesday night and on Thursday night. Let me tell you what I do in those Bible studies. I prepare, and I don't just come and just tell you anything. I prepare. So it takes me about six hours. Not that I don't know the Bible, but I search every single thing out. One of the reasons why it's in-depth, it takes me six hours. Uh, to just research. Most of the time I'm just lost in scripture and I'm going from one side to another. It's one of the reasons why I believe one of, the, one of my fortes, why God gave me an ability to do that, to connect scriptures and to connect stories that are there and then to make that application. Then for about three hours for each, each study, uh, I take all charts and I make them up. I compile charts, put them together so that it's a one, two, three and it's all, it's all synchromatic and it all fits together. Well, I got here today. I usually download it. I got here today. And by the way, this has been my week. I went to, uh, I went to Memphis to preach and uh, they had no PowerPoint, Pastor, Pastor Justin, no PowerPoint. So I brought it up there and we had to reconstruct there to get the PowerPoint. It worked great. We had an amazing service. Uh, but I realized that technology is something that the enemy can use. Somebody say amen. But I'm going to let you know the enemy will never stop us, whether it's technology or not. Ch Pastor Justin has just recaptured re, uh, about half of our slides. And so we have some slides. Now, let me tell you, if we didn't have the slides, I'm still going to preach this. I just like the slides because we're a visual group. Everybody's visual anymore. I like to show you things. So we're in Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 9. You won't get all the slides. I can't explain all of them to you, but you will get most of them. Uh, the key verse here, I call this the battle of faith. We're talking about, uh, we're talking about this drama that's, hacking, uh, that's happening in Acts. Let me remind you, these are real people. Before you put halos around everyone, let me tell you, they have struggles. They have turmoil. They have things in their life that are going on. Sometimes we do a disservice to people like Paul and to people like Peter by putting halos on them when they're living. Let me tell you why. Because they're going through emotions just like you're going through. They're trusting in God just like we have to trust through God, in God. And they have their doubts just like we have their doubts of people and things and places. So the key verse that we have, there was a command given by Jesus. The key verse in the entire book of Acts is in chapter 1. Now we've previously, previously studied it, but let's revisit it now and because uh, it's well known by us. But let's see how, that now it's well on its way to becoming fulfilled. Jesus gave this command in Acts. You shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is a ripple effect. If I took a pebble and dropped it into a pond, you're going to see an immediate concise circle. Then you're going to see those circles start to go out. This is what Jesus said. This word, this gospel, is going to be dropped in Jerusalem. After Jerusalem, it's going to go out to Samaria. After Samaria, it's going to go out to the uttermost parts of Judea and the uttermost parts of the world. Now, I want you to understand how that happened. We have three key areas. We have, we have the area of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then the last one is all of the earth. So four, actually. So, so far, we've seen three key ones. We have three key figures that were, figures that were used. We see Peter used in Jerusalem. We've already gone through Peter's history and in Acts. Then we see Philip. Philip was one that actually took it to Judea and Samaria. And then we see now Paul. Paul's going to take it to the Galatians, to Asia Minor, all the way to Rome. He's going to take it to the entire known world. And we look at, we have three key points to the church. We know that the church now is going to be expanded. It's, it's the start of the church. It is the, it is the, the uh, input of the church, the start of the church, and then the expansion of the church. We're in the expansion of the church from chapters 13 to the end of Acts it's church expansion to the ends of the earth it's almost like a balloon if you can see it the lips to the balloon are what happened in Jerusalem the Holy Spirit breathing in and as the Holy Spirit breathes in that balloon just is going to go all over the world and to the point where you and I are saved today because of this initial this initial push by the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts so we're watching it to the ends of the earth and the key figure used in that expansion and that will continue to be used in that expansion is the Apostle Paul. This man is an amazing man. I had a bio for him. I'll probably give it to you next week. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you several things as we line up for our, for our, for our message next week that I have this week. But it's a bio for him. Paul is an amazing man. 17 of your New Testament books were written by Paul. And as we start to see Acts unfold, I'm going to show you exactly where he wrote the books. You are watching. You are, you are in the prince of the Apostle Paul. You're actually going every place he went. And as he goes those places, there's going to be some stops there. But he's actually going to write letters and it's going to make sense to you. Let me tell you what's really going to have, help you and uh, happen for you in the next couple weeks, the next several months. You're going to start seeing Paul not only walking through the, through the, uh, the known world and bringing the gospel, but you're going to watch when he stops and what book he re writes to who. And so it's going to start making sense to you where he wrote the Galatian book and why he wrote it. So right now you 
you just see the book says Philemon, you see Galatians, you see Hebrews, but you don't know the context of why or where he wrote those books. You're going to see that. You're going to see the first one he wrote tonight after this, after this encounter that we have in Acts this time. So uh, let's continue in Acts chapter 15. And the theme of this chapter is something that really a lot of pastors stay away from. This is a problem that arises in the church. There's a massive problem that's ready to split the church right down the middle. This bludgeoning, excuse me, this burgeoning church right down the middle. It's, going, it's something that's happened that's going to, that's, that's a very large problem. We have a lot of hot potatoes in the church today. We have the hot potatoes of gay marriage. We have the hot potatoes of homosexuality just running rampant. We have the hot potatoes of, of transgenderism. We have a lot of hot potatoes that are in the church. But this one, and the church is splitting. Not our, not the, this church, not the a church that's saved, but churches that are nominal are splitting. They're embracing worldly things. Well, there is a massive move going on in this church that's looking to get a, a massive split in that first century because the enemy loves to divide the church. Somebody say amen. amen. Let me remind you that God never divides a church. He multiplies believers. He adds to them. He doesn't subtract and he doesn't divide it. So Paul and Barnabas have just completed their first missionary journey in late 40 AD. And so we give you history, we give you archaeology, we give you a little bit of literature. So we're going to show you this. This is what we've just studied. This is the map of where they went. And so as you see this map, you can understand that they have been going, they have been going, I'm not sure if you can see that red dot, there it is. They started over here in Syria, Antioch, and they went down to, the, to Cyprus. Then from Cyprus, they went to the mainland of, of what we know now as Turkey. And then from there, they had several cities in Turkey, and then they backtracked and went all the way back through to Antioch. By the way, this is Antioch Pisidian, Antioch Syria. We get confused sometimes. This is where the church is pretty much centered. Jerusalem has moved its center to Antioch. So the Christians were first called Christians in Antioch. So Paul and Barnabas and John Mark start out from there. This is what we've been studying so far. It's late 40 AD. They don't spend much time in the cities that they just visited. This first missionary journey does not take a long time. Perhaps a year, a year and a half. They're on the, they're on the road, if you would, for about a year and a half speaking the gospel. And when they return to Syria, Antioch, uh, Paul writes his first letter to the Galatians. Now, you need to understand that they're returning to Syria, Antioch. That's an archaeological ruins of the street, uh, the main street that Paul probably walked down. And so they come back and he writes from Syria, Antioch, he writes a letter to the Galatians. Do you see where Galatia is? Everybody see where Galatia is? Galatia is the cities that he just, he just visited. So you just went through the first missionary journey. The book of Galatians is a book back to those people. So next time you read Galatians, think about Derby. Think about Lystra where they stoned him. Think about the ones that rose up against him. Think about what he has to tell the church when all these Judaizers are coming down. You, it will give you a context for the book of Galatians. How many are with me? Because he's writing because of his history. He's encouraging those churches going through the same problems that he faced when he was going through those things. How many get it tonight? So the entire half. They return to Syria, Antioch. He writes to the Galatians. Most likely, again, he's writing to the churches he visits on this first missionary journey. It's interesting to me. I want to throw this in. Paul, we have 1,000, we have 5,300 copies of his letters. 5,300 copies in various forms because he wrote them and they were everywhere. Church would get it, give it to another church. We have two copies of, the, of Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. So when you want to think about the veracity of Scripture and the truthfulness of Scripture, let me tell you, historically, Scripture proves itself out. We have the copies that are there. And now, uh, you know your New Testament is going to uh, start to fit together as we continue to go through Acts. And now from Syria, Antioch, he's going to travel to Jerusalem. So he's back in Syria, Antioch, and something's going on. There's a problem. So he's back in Syria, Antioch, and he's going to take a small trip to Jerusalem. I say small trip, it's a little bit of a trip, but he's going to take a detour from his missionary journey. He wants to go back out on the mission field, but something's happening in the church. There's a problem in the church, and he has to address it. And from Syria, Antioch, he travels to Jerusalem before his second missionary journey for the Jerusalem Council. It's probably around 49 AD. So this council will be the content of Acts chapter 15. The title of this chapter, The Battle of Faith. It almost sounds like an oxymoron purposely. Faith itself isn't a battle. It's a gift of God. Faith is something God gives you. It's a gift. He gives it to all men, as a matter of fact, that enables us to act in His love. That's what faith is. The battle is to live by faith alone. Now, I'm going to underscore this tonight because we're all guilty of this. When I say all of us, all of us are guilty of this. All of us are guilty of not accepting the gift of faith because we have a battle with something and I'm going to share with you. You see, it's for us, it's for us, 
something in order to be justified or righteous, and not only for ourselves, but for others. We feel that we've got to do something for God in order for God to accept us. That is not true. Now, you've got to listen to this because it's something that you really need, you hear, need to hear it all the way down the line, and you need to hear the fullness of it. Our temptation is to attach standards, practices, regulations, in addition to our faith, to make us feel righteous. Rules, ordinances, conditions. And you just came back from staying with your family for Rosh Hashanah. Can I ask a couple questions? Do you mind? Sure, okay. Is your family religious? No. They're not religious, but yet they celebrate Rosh Hashanah. Tradition and family. Tradition and family. So, do they know what they're celebrating? They do. They do. Do they say anything about God when they're celebrating not it? Not at all. Not at all. We eat. You eat? We visit. And you visit. There's traditions, but would they think you were not a good Jew if you didn't go to that? <laughs> I'd get in trouble. You'd get in trouble. So, in order to be a good Jew, you have to go to those traditional things. Because that makes you Jewish. Really. I mean, you're born it, but it makes you Jewish. Uh, Andy is actually a, a saved Jew. Uh, he is, a, he is a, uh, a Jew that believes in Jesus Christ. Um, some people call it a completed Jew, which is really an insult. To, other Jews take that as an insult, but he's a completed Jew. So he sits, he sits in Rosh Hashanah, which he knows the spiritual implications of, and he realizes that, you know, God's not going to be mentioned. He loves his family. But they are going through a tradition and emotion. Are you ready for this? Sometimes you can go to church just through a tradition and emotion. You can be that way. Now, I want you to listen to me just for a minute because we're going to get pretty deep tonight. Our temptation is to attach standards to our faith. Uh, the result is self-justification and judgment. Okay, so let me ask you. What must you do to get to heaven? Anyone? Repent and ask Jesus into your life, right? Into your life. So what else? How about feed the poor? No. Nope. How about give tithes to the church? No. Nope. How about go to Sunday school? No. How about go to church? No. You mean you can get to heaven without going to church? Yeah. Okay. How about say the stations of the cross? No. Nope. How about pray every day? No, you don't. The thief on the pro cross never prayed a prayer in his life and he went to heaven. True. My father never prayed a prayer in his life and went to heaven. Now just listen, follow it out. How about narrow down your sins? Does that, if you work on your sins, that'll get you to heaven. No. How about follow all the Christian rules? How about love everyone? Nope. Because we have trouble with it. It's hard for us to understand it, isn't it? Now hold on. We do those things because of obedience. And in order to receive the blessings of God here on earth and to receive rewards in heaven. There are things we should do. Not to get us to heaven. None of those things will get you to heaven. You can't buy your way into heaven. You can't pray your way into heaven. You can't love your way into heaven. You can't do a thing. It's a gift. Faith is a gift. I have people asking me all the time. We do these questions and answers on YouTube. And people ask me about their word if they're still saved. Let me tell you something. Salvation is a gift from God. Faith is a gift from God. You have to accept Christ in salvation. But once you do, it's a gift of God. You can't, you cannot do anything to gain heaven other than salvation. Salvation plus zero equals heaven. Oh, no, I'm not getting a whole lot of amen. Some of you are still hung up on this. Look, Martin Luther was a devoted Catholic monk. I had several, several quotes from him that I want to give you tonight. We can't, I don't have them now, but uh, I have a couple, but they're not the ones I wanted to give you. He had some nagging problems with his practice of religion. He was a monk. He was a Catholic monk. He lived in, a, he lived in an abbey. He lived in a dormitory. A dormition, abbey is in Jerusalem. Dormitory comes from the word sleep. Dorme in French means sleep. Frere Jacques, Frere Jacques, dormez-vous. Uh, are you sleeping? Are you sleeping, Brother John? And so dorme is what we... By the way, if you want to know where, where it is in your house, how many of you have dormers up in your, up in your second floor? How many have dormers? How many know what a dormer is? That's from the French word dormé to sleep because it's upstairs. You don't have dormers on the first floor. You have them on the, on the top floor. So why did they call it Domitian Abbey? Or why did they call them these abbeys? Because they spent nothing but doing service for God. What they did, some of them were aesthetics. Some of them went and they didn't talk to anyone. They were cloistered. Some of them just did work all day long. Some of them copied the scriptures all day long. Good things to do, but they felt that that was going to get them closer to God. If I sat you down in a room and you did work for God every single day, every hour of the day, will that get you closer to God? Absolutely not. And that's hard for us to understand. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do things for God. Obviously, faith without works is dead. But if we think that works will get us to God, we're wrong. Nothing you can do is going to get you to God. It's a gift. Nothing's going to get you to heaven. Now watch.
Just listen to it, because we're going to tell you a couple things. So Martin Luther gets a little bit upset. He gets upset because he's doing all these works for God 24-7, and he still feels miserable. He still feels like he has so much sin. Man, how many of that, don't raise your hand, how many of that is us? You can do no matter what you can do for God, you still feel crummy. Uh, somebody give me a couple of amens on that one. Amen. You feel like, man, I'm, I've blown it. I'm not good enough. Uh, God can't accept me. And so you work a little bit more, you try to do a little bit more. And basically, you still have that same feeling. This is what Martin Luther had. He's doing all the Catholic doctrines. He's doing all the work. He's scrubbing floors every day of his life. He's getting up. He's scrubbing floors. He's serving his fellow brethren. He's doing everything that's Christian to do. And he still feels this nagging pain. Something's wrong. He's praying. He's doing novenas. Nova. Nine. He's praying for nine days, so that nine days straight on certain issues so something would happen. He's fasting. And he still feels this nagging thing that he's just not good enough. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever felt, even though you're saved, that you're just not good enough? It's every single one of us. It's the human condition. And I want to I talk about it tonight. So what was Martin Luther saying when he said this? He said... At last, meditating day and night by the mercy of God, I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that through which the righteous live, by the faith of God, namely by faith. Here I felt as if I were entirely born again and had entered the paradise itself through the gates that had been flung open. Martin Luther finally came to the, re to the realization that it doesn't mean anything what I'm doing for God. God's given me his righteousness without me doing a single thing. And so then he says something like this. He says, for in, the, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, for faith. As it is written, the righteous or the just shall live by faith. So Martin Luther comes to this and he says, you know, all these ordinances that I got to follow from the Catholic Church, all these things I got to do, all of that's just rules. That doesn't get me closer to God. All that gets me closer to God is I have to live by the faith he gave me. He started something called protest. Actually, it was, it was called the Great Schism. It divided the, the Catholic Church. It was, a, it was a protest. He did not want to lead the Catholic Church. He pinned a thesis, 96 thesis, to the Wittenberg Castle door so he could have someone debate him, some other monks debate him. Similarly to something like this, you can ask questions and say, why are we praying for the dead? Why do we take money to pray for the dead? Why do we have indulgences? Why do we do this? Why do we have these works we do? He wanted somebody to talk to him. And basically, the Pope's response was to put out a papal bull. You know what that is? That's an execution. They, they put, out, they put a, out a death order for him to be killed as a heretic. And so he sealed, sealed himself away and he wrote the Bible. Not because it was a work, so they could put it in common language for people that they can understand it. And he wrote most of the hymns that the church used to sing. So Martin Luther gets this, this idea that the just shall live by faith. Look, we're not alone in thinking that something has to be added to faith in order to make us justified with God. The early church struggled with it also. The early church thought something had to be added to this faith in order for them to be recognized by God. The gap between the laws of Judaism and the cross were widening. Peter was doing something with Cornelius. Paul was with the Gentiles. The gap was widening. Now listen, it's one thing to offer salvation to God-fearing Gentiles, but it's quite another thing to offer Christ to Gentiles who were not first initiated into the law of Moses. They had to do something, did they not? Did they not have to get circumcised? How could they be accepted if they weren't circumcised? How many are following me tonight? So they're adding something to the faith. This is the big schism that's coming up. The big problem. The problem was that Paul and his followers believed it was by faith alone that a person was justified or made right with God. And he's absolutely right. And the Pharisee party, not the same Pharisees and Jesus, these are saved Pharisees. The saved Pharisees, the religious rulers that gave their hearts to Christ in Jerusalem, who are saved, believe in Christ, know all of the law of Moses and followed it their whole lives. Listen, they believe that Gentiles must become full participants in Hebraic legalism and customs in addition to faith in Christ as a fulfillment for Israel, Israel's Messiah. And their disciples, even more obstinate, were what was known as Judaizers. A Judaizer in the church wants to get you to start doing the things of Judaism so you can be accepted by God. It happens today. There are Christians today. And he's a Jew. He's a, he's, a, he's a Jew who is saved. He's a Christian. Okay? But there are people that would like you to... Now, I believe we should learn everything we can about the Jewish faith because it's a shadow and type of Christ. But you cannot go back and do those things. You know, the Seventh-day Adventists worship on Saturday because they're Judaizers. They believe that you have the mark of the beast, and so do I, because we worship on Sundays. Now, listen to me. This has been a problem all along in the church. So these Judaizers come up to Paul and they say, and, and there's, a, there's a, a schism growing 
in Jerusalem. They're saying, how could these Gentiles accept Christ if they're not Hebrews, if they're not Jews, if they're not circumcised? These are uncircumcised. Read the Old Testament. Uncircumcised dog Philistines. Read it. The circumcision was a covenant. It meant you were gods. How could they be gods? How could they be saved if they're not circumcised? We, they have to get circumcised. Now, you, just, you, could, you can say that to a baby that's eight days old, but try saying that to somebody who's 30 years old. So they've got to get circumcised. Otherwise, they can't be part of the fellowship of God. How many are getting this? How many are getting it? Yeah. All right. So, it's a battle of faith. The great challenge of Paul's life was the struggle to keep faith in Christ and not fulfilling the Mosaic Law as the only basis of salvation. Many preachers and teachers who preach or teach on Acts either skip the 15th chapter, I guarantee you, you probably never heard a message on it, or they pass over it lightly. They find it difficult to look at the wrangles of the early church and a meeting of church leaders in Jerusalem and find, and find the lessons that, were, that they apply to contemporary life uh, in the uh, technological, computerized world of the concrete jungle we live in. And yet every generation has to go back and remake for itself the decision arrived in at the Jerusalem church, at that summit meeting we're about to consider. The struggle for faith alone for justification is as real today as it was for Luther or Calvin during the watershed days of the Reformation. It's a struggle in our time, not only for the organized church, but for every single one of us every day and most hours of every day. We ask, isn't there something else I can do or be to be sure of God's approval in my life? The struggle for faith alone never ends. It's a part of our own inability to accept the gift. And deeper than that, we want to be loved because of what we do for God. Are you listening? Unconditional love is both difficult to receive and at times almost impossible for us to extend to others. Acts 15 is as real as this morning's headlines because it happens to every one of us. And I'm not contradicting myself here, but before we quickly jump on Paul's side here, let's see the whole heart of these initial Judaizers and what it really was. We need their back, this background for perspective and the real struggle that we all still go through. And that's my intro for Acts chapter 15 without having... The magnifying glass, so the magnifying glass is on Jerusalem. We see that this is the spot now, Jerusalem of old. And uh, I believe it's this. I believe Acts chapter 15 verse 1 tells us the beginning of it. It says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren, so they're Christians, and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Does that happen today? Unless you receive communion, you cannot be saved. Unless you get baptized, you cannot be saved. It happens today, does it not? Listen, there are churches out, out here, Christian churches, that say, unless you're baptized, you can't be saved. Well, I wonder what they would do with the thief on the cross. Amen. I wonder what they would do with somebody who just gets saved and there's no water around and they die. I wonder what they would do with that. With somebody who just gets saved and a bomb comes and hits them and, they, and kills them in a war and they don't get what God's going to say, well, you know why you didn't get baptized. Well, that, that, that delineates what Christ did for us and elevates baptism over Jesus. Come on, how many are with me tonight? So here's the deal. We all struggle to climb this ladder towards God. Man, is this not a real message or what? We all struggle to climb this ladder towards God. We all have problems with it. We all feel less than adequate. We all feel like, man, I'm, I'm such a mess up. Look what I did. I love God and I did this today or I did that today. And we beat ourselves up for it. Just listen, because it's very powerful and it's not something new. So we try to climb this ladder towards God. Is this what we have to do to get to closer to God? Continue to just try to climb this ladder? The Christian Pharisees and the circumcision party from Judea were not bad people. They weren't bad people at all. They believed that God's strategy for history had been in and through his chosen people. The Jews. And it was. He had given them the Ten Commandments and the basics of, law, of how to live as his people in the regulations given through Moses. Circumcision became the catch-all word for the obedience to the law, obedience to God. And law meant everything from taking no other gods before the Lord to the most minute details of cleanliness. The people of Israel would not have survived as a distinct people without the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And also the laws were very practical regulations for their health and for their survival. When you hear that the Jews are the chosen people, what are they chosen for? They were chosen to bring a Messiah. They lived in, a, in, an, in an era where huge nations were being wiped out because of hepatitis. Uh, they, would eat, they would eat scavengers from the sea. If you want to look at the Levitical laws of the Jews, they can't eat scavengers. Why? Not because God's trying to make us not eat scavengers in the sea today, but because back then there was no FDA. Back then they died as a people. How many understand it? 
And so there's those dietary laws were to keep them alive so they could produce a Messiah. And so as we see this, they, these, these Pharisees know this. The difficulty occurred when the law became a ladder to be climbed uh, to salvation. They thought the law was part of this ladder. They thought you had, to, you had to fulfill the law, these rules, or you couldn't get close to God. Now, rather than seeing the law as an expression of God's love for his people and preservation for their people, it's because something they must do in order to be loved. There is nothing you can do to God, for God that will make him love you more or less. Let me repeat that. There's nothing you can do for God that will make him love you more or less. God, for God so loved the entire world, Amen. the good people, the bad people, the ugly people, yeah. that he gave his only begotten son. God's love is unconditional. It's spread out no matter how far you go. It's spread out. How many are with me tonight? Yeah. It offered the security of this law for them, the security and assurance that if the law was fulfilled impeccably, then they could be sure that they were right with God. Gave them righteousness. Man, we have people that think they're so self-righteous sometimes. Yeah, I've, I've had people come up to me and say, you really, with that Christian little sway, you really think you know what you're talking about? No, I just happen to study this thing 24-7. How good are you? <laughs> but he never intended that keeping the law should be a substitute for him. Let me give you a human analogy of a parent and a child. A parent knows that children need rules to follow. How many of you know that if you have children? If you're not putting down rules for your kids, get ready, you're going to visit them in jail. Amen. Listen, listen. Learning obedience to the parent is necessary preparation for self-discipline. So, out of love, the parent lays down certain regulations for the child's welfare. They are not to be a burden, but a guide to responsible and rewarding life. To stress the importance, they're enforced so that they become part of the character of the child and, the, and, uh, and for the child's welfare. For the child, they become oughts. You ought to do this, you ought to do that, which, when done, bring approval for the, from the parent. The idea is developed early that earn, earning that approval brings a feeling of pleasure from the parent and in the child. Now, the parent never intended that the basis for living become a substitution for loving. Affectionate relationship between him or her and the child. But even when the parent has not said it, or even implied it, the daddy won't love me unless I do what he said syndrome sets in. So we want to please daddy because of what he said. That causes two reactions. Some children desire to please so much that they make every effort to do what's, ever, what's been established as, you, as the you oughts of life. Others must test every regulation and break most of them to assert independence and really to test the extent of parents' love. Wow. I just gave you the scenario to every family raising children and to the mindset of nearly every teenager alive. Amen. And every child under 12 who wants to please the parent. You raise until 12 years old, they're going to please you. After 12 years old, they're going to test you. That's exactly what happens. And so, now press the analogy just a step further. What if the child who has kept the rules sees one of their siblings, another child, break them or bypass them? And what happens if the obedient child is told that the parent accepted and loved the disobedient child just as much as they loved the obedient child? That cannot be. Everything I've done was right. My father would not allow that. Everything that's important has been bypassed by my sibling. All that I've done to please my father has been, neg has been neglected. My brother must do what's required before he can expect to be loved. That's not right, Dad. I've been following you my whole life. And my brother over here doesn't follow anything you do. And you love him just like you love me? That's not right. Don't we want to complain that? Because we think it's what you do to get acceptance instead of the father's love. Are you with me? You know what I just told you about? I just told you about the prodigal son. Yeah. Yeah. Prodigal son, the elder brother, was ticked because he did everything the father wanted him to do. Why would you love this guy that's, that's gone out and, and squandered everything you've given him, hasn't done any of the rules, and he comes back and you love him and have a party for him? This is exactly what's happening in that first church. Big brother says, I've been good. The prodigal has not been good. And you love him like you love me? even though I kept all the rules and he broke all the rules? It's the reason I believe there is this child nature inside of every single one of us. Our sense of justice is rooted in the obey to please scenario. And that principle becomes our security. If we obey, we're pleasing someone. And it's, protect and it's pro projected onto God as a cosmic spiritual parent. Whatever way we've viewed our father is usually the way we're going to view God. If your father beats you, God's going to be hard. Your, your, your concept of God's going to be a tough concept. If your father abandoned you, then when you pray, you're really not going to feel like God answers you. 
If your father made you obey certain things, then you're going to think you have to obey things. And most of our fathers did. You're going to think you have to obey things in order to have the acceptance of God. So just listen to it tonight. You still with me tonight? Yeah. How could God offer a relationship of love to anyone who doesn't meet the requirements that I've tried to live up through all these years? The controversy between Paul's insistence that faith alone justifies and the Christian Pharisees' idea that God would not set aside the law in receiving a Gentile believer is really the parable of the prodigal son written in large and gigantic social issue. Most of the converted Pharisees did not want to exclude the Gentiles. They were good people. They simply wanted them to play by the rules that they had and keep the law God had given them through Moses. You see, the crux of the problem is this. These Judaizers had no problems with Gentiles being saved and added to the church, but they were convinced that Gentiles first needed to be circumcised and become Jews. Nothing less than the truth of the gospel was at stake. This was a huge, huge issue. So, Hebraic, some of them didn't even want to require full initiation to, into Hebraic principle, disciplines before a Gentile could become a Christian. But inclusion in the church was something different. The Christian Pharisees were all agreed that becoming a Jew in every sense was required for membership in the church. The requirements for a Gentile to become a proselyte to Hebrewism was transferred as the absolute minimum for becoming a fellow, in, fellow participant in the body. The Christian Pharisees were elder brothers who not only had kept the rules, but insisted that they knew what was required by the Father to please the Father. Oh, wow. I'm going to go on before I teach a little bit more. Acts, Acts 15.2 When therefore Bar Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension, that means it was gigantic, and disputation with them. They had a fight. They had an argument, a huge argument with them. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Let me throw something in that has nothing to do with it. You'll notice it says up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is actually south of it. Every time you refer to Jerusalem in the Bible, you're going up because you're going ascending a hill. So you always go up to Jerusalem no matter what location you're at. So, wow. So a council is set up. The very first church council uh, to settle this debate. And by the way, there have been other church councils. Let me give you just a couple of them. This is one. The first one, the next one was Nicaea. Council of Nicaea, 325 AD. The issue was the eternal deity of Christ. Christians were wondering, was Jesus, was he always Jesus? And so they set up a council because there was a division. Arius says Christ is a created being. And Athesius says God. The outcome, eternal deity of Christ affirmed the Nicene Creed. And so there was a division. People didn't think that Jesus was, was, was God. That's still going on today. There are Christians on television that some people watch, maybe even in this church. That some people watch a popular woman preacher that believes in docetism. Docetism. That Jesus wasn't Christ. He became Christ after he was resurrected from the dead. Listen. And she's a Christian preacher and people follow her like crazy. There's the Council of Constantinople at 381. The person of Christ. Apollinarius said Christ is divine logos, not a human spirit. The guy was Gregory of Nestasians. He, he said, so the outcome is that complete humanity of Christ affirmed, the Nicene Creed confirmed. Jesus was all God, all man. The first church didn't know that. These churches didn't know that. Ephesus Council, the person of Christ, the bad guy was Nestorius. And Nestorius said this, he was against the deity of Christ. Christ was not God. And then the good guy was Cyril of Alexandria. The complete deity of Christ is affirmed. And I see and create a firm. So there have been charges all the way down the line, checking back and forth. Then there's the Chalcedon uh, Council. One, the person of Christ again. Look at how many times it comes up. Eutychus is the bad guy. Christ is a ter uh, tertium quid, if you believe what that is. A third unique nature. So he's saying, no, Christ is not, is not God. He's not human. He's something in between that. Well, the good guy is Flavian of Constantinople and Leo of Rome. The two natures of Christ are affirmed. He has a human nature and he has a divine nature. He's the son of man. He's the son of God. He has a human spirit and he is part of God's spirit. And that is all God, all man. So that's what you believe today. But there were big struggles before that happened. This is the first big struggle. Are you still with me tonight? So, Acts chapter 15 verse 3 gets us a little further and it says this. It says, And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenix and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles as they caused great joy unto all the brethren. So I showed you the chart. They're going down from Antioch. They're going all the way down to Jerusalem. But they don't waste any time. They're evangelists. And so basically what they're doing is they're, is they're evangelizing. Uh, and so they're not taking time off. That's what they do. I was in the, uh, I was in the uh, Walmart the other day getting some food. Uh, I don't know. Sure, I was going someplace. I had to get a couple little things. And so I'm in there and a young man comes past me and he gives me a track about how to get saved. And he says, uh, he gives me a track. And I, I said, well, thank you. And he said, uh, I said, uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an evangelist. He said, well, just throw it away. I said, well, I'm an evangelist. Why don't you give me the track? I'll give it to somebody else. That's what I do. So this is what they did. They were evangelizing on their way. Now watch as we go on. 
Just look at what's going on. So notice what it says in Acts chapter 15, verse 3. It says, uh, through Phoenix and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. Then they go this. No, those are Gentile areas. It says, and when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. So they give a testimony of everything that's been happening among the Gentiles. Now, let me go a little bit further. We're just going to read it. It says this, but there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that, which believed they were Christians, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, here's the deal. They tell them everything God's done for these people, the Gentiles. They tell them all the miracles that have happened that God's done. And somebody says, yeah, but they didn't do this. We've got to get them circumcised. So that means Paul's got to go back to all those churches, write letters, and he's got to tell them everybody that's become a believer from the Gentiles, we need to have a circumcision ceremony. How many of you think there's going to be a lot of people left in the church? <laughs> Not a whole lot. Maybe so. Maybe they would have done it. But the thing is, was this necessary? Watch what goes on. Acts, 6, Acts 15, 6 and 7. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago. Notice those three words, good while ago. This is not something that just occurred. This is about 10 years after Peter went to Cornelius' house. So this has been brewing for 10 years. For 10 years people have been talking about this. How that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So Peter's standing up for them. Now just, just follow me just a little bit tonight as we go a little further. Acts 15, 8, 9. And God which knows the hearts bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. And Peter, so Peter sticks up for them. Now listen, it's not over yet. In short, Peter is saying to the council, why put a yoke on the necks of, on the necks of these new believers? Yokes were for controls of animals, by the way. He's also saying, we Hebrews, having kept the law ourselves, why now put it on the necks of, our new, of new converts? By the way, you need to understand the difference of what a yoke means. The idea of a yoke in that time refers to a learning experience. Jesus said this. He said, to put my yoke upon you. This is what he said. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Now listen real well right now, because this is where it's going to hit. The reference is to the training yoke of oxen. The real, what he's referring to, what Jesus is referring to here, and what Peter is referring to is this. When you have a young oxen that wants to be trained in the field, you have two different yokes that are tied together by a big, by a big uh, board. The one is for a, a, a mature oxen, and the other one's for an immature oxen. One's big, one's small. The idea is, as the small one goes with the, the uh, elderly one, the one more mature, he can learn the ropes. He can learn where he has to go. He's being trained. And so basically, we're watching something happen that Jesus said, take my yoke on you. Let me train you. Let me show you what you need to do. Paul says, why are you putting this, this elderly yoke on them when they're just young? Why are you putting this on them? They can't bear this. So perhaps Peter's saying, why require training in the law when that brought us neither peace nor power of God? The salient concern was salvation, and the Hebrews had come no closer to that because of the law. It didn't get them closer to salvation. The grace of the Lord had saved them, not their own efforts to keep the law. Not the law and Christ, but Christ only. Look, let me get it down to today. Even today, Jesus came to yoke us to him, not to, uh, not to give us a set of do's and don'ts, not to a, a set of rules and regulations, not to a set of laws. And for new converts, not even to the standards of older converts, more mature. It's not right for somebody who gets saved to come in here and somebody who's an older Christian tell them what they need to do. You know, the, the hippie movement, I probably told you this before, the hippie movement back in the 60s, they were into love. They were into Jesus' words. They really understood it in the beginning of it. So they went to churches all over California, flooded into churches all over California. Long hair, beads, the whole works. But they were looking for love. They were looking for Christ's love. And the churches rejected them. They rejected them and they became a movement that really spawned so much evil because they went the opposite way. Listen, just because somebody's different. I'm, I, listen, I've pastored a church for a long, long time. There were people that would come to my church. I remember the first church I pastored. We decided to start a... Uh, I had... Um, you, you remember Dot. I told you about her. She was, a, she was really an older Christian that just had a set of rules and regulations and couldn't take anything. Well, we decided to have an outreach. This church was small. They had a youth group that would get together for, the, for Assemblies of God. It was called Christian Ambassadors. And once a month, they'd bring the youth group. And whoever had the biggest root group, uh, youth group would get, a, would get a trophy. And there'd be some, some preaching and teaching. Well, 
we would we uh, started I started this Cheryl and I started it we rented in this first church we rented a little building and we put pool tables in it and we put some we put a counseling session in it and we put for the for the for the youth of this city and we put um, and we put uh, loudspeakers outside and we put um, Christian music on. Well, kids flooded. There was no place for them to go. Kids came in like crazy. We would, normally the church, before I got there, would take three kids to this Christ ambassador. We'd take 150 kids. And they would say, what's going on? Well, we were playing pool. So, so Ott and some other people came up and said, you have to, they, they would be smoking their cigarettes. I, I think they were cigarettes. Maybe there's something else. <laughs> and they would put, our rule was you couldn't smoke inside. They put them out. They come in. They play pool. They listen to this music that was kind of different for them, but in the same type of beat. And we saw kids getting saved. Well, the good old folks of the church rose up and said, you can't have that. We're a respectable church. You can't do that. I said, I'll tell you what. If I can't do it, you've got to find another pastor. Because this is who Christ came for. Amen. You know, I've had it all over. People said, well, you know, he's smoking. Pastor, he's smoking outside the church. In cathedral, there's a bunch of guys smoking outside the church. I said, where are they going? Are they going away from the church or to the church? I said, I think they're coming to the church. I said, leave them alone. Somebody asked me when we were taking questions, if you smoke and you get to heaven, we were on Facebook, yeah, you can get there, you can get there a little faster than us, but you're going to get there. <laughs> Just listen. Listen. Next week, Lord willing, you're going to see the amazing outcome to this very first problem, this major problem in the early church and it being resolved in Jerusalem. But let me close by giving some life lessons. Number one, everyone will not agree with everything you say and believe. It's okay. Number two, even your family that are all Christians will have religious differences of opinion with you. There are lots of controversial issues floating around Christian circles today among Christians. The Jerusalem Council was not made up of good guys and bad guys. They were all good people converted to Christ and all sure that they were right. Man, it's the hardest thing you can do is disagree with someone and they think they're right and you think they're right. Come on, how many of you know that? Come on, husbands and wives, raise your hands. Have you ever been in a situation like that? I have many times. Yeah. Next week, we're going to see the positive outcome and we will explore the ways you can resolve conflicts in your own life with family and friends. I will give you a way, I will give you a list on how to resolve conflicts godly, the godly way. But tonight, I'm moved by something else. I'm moved by this picture right here. I'm moved by this. How do we get closer to God? Are you struggling to climb the ladder to God? Remember, the just shall live by faith. What does that mean? Do you at times feel less than righteous? I mean, not good enough? I know there are tons of people listening to me who feel like failures, who feel God can't use them, who feel less than saved, who feel their failings limit their closeness to God. So I want to remind you tonight, you know what I had at the end of this tonight? I had 11 charts. I was going to bombard you. I, mean, I was going to tell you, take out, your, take out your phones because these charts, you're going to want every single one of them on your phone. You'll get them next week. We, can't, we couldn't download them. But here's what I want to end with tonight. I want to tell you this. I'm going to try to be as, as gentle as I can with this and as, as uh, non-compromising as I can. People will come up to me, and I, I respect it. I really do. I respect them saying it. You know, when somebody comes in, and, you know, last week I told you that about compliments, and I told you about saying something's good. Listen, you can still, still tell me a message is good. I'm okay with that. But uh, sometimes people come up to me and say, Pastor, we need your prayers because uh, we need your prayers. My prayers aren't any different than yours. I got news for you. There's no evangelist on the planet that has any prayers different than yours. And somebody said to me, well, you know, I just don't feel worthy. None of us are worthy. So what makes my prayers better than your prayers? They're not better than your prayers. If you say a prayer of faith, they're the same as my prayer. You know why? Because God loves me just like he loves you. And he loves us the same. A hard concept for us to believe is that, well, you're doing the work of God, Pastor Mark. You are in a position. Let me tell you something. To whom much is given, much is required. I am doing something because God called me to this. But maybe he called you to be a housewife. Maybe he called you to do something to, to love your family. Don't make that sound like that's something less. It's a position God's called you to. We have a trouble. We think if we're actively involved in the ministry doing something, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, uh, help me understand what I'm saying. But don't have the concept thinking that's going to get you closer to God. Don't have the concept thinking that's going to make it right with you and God. It's not. We're never going to stand in our own righteousness. You can do everything you want. Martin Luther did everything he possibly could do and he still felt like a crumb. 
He felt horrible. And he realized, why am I feeling this way? I'm, work, I'm trying to work myself into heaven. The just shall live by faith. Listen to me. There are people listening on YouTube tonight. There's people listening on, on Facebook tonight. And let me tell you what they're thinking. Oh, they're thinking, well, you know, I, I did this in my life. And I did this last week. And I did that. And, you know, I, I love God. But, but I've done this. And I've done that. And I wonder how God looks at me. I'm going to tell you how God looks at you. He loves you. Right. He looks at you through his son, Jesus Christ, as not having one single flaw. Let me give you my illustration. I didn't bring it. If God is all pure, and he is, the Bible says in Haggai that he cannot look on sin. God the Father can't look on your sin. He can't look on it. That's why he turned his back on Christ on the cross. So imagine a big styrofoam ball and imagine it all white. That's God. Now imagine you. You are and I, we are shaping in iniquity. We are, we have a bend towards evil. You can thank your father Adam. Let's all thank Adam. Thank you Adam. Okay, you, can, you have a bend towards evil. So we are a black styrofoam ball down here. God cannot look on that styrofoam ball. He can't look on evil. Jesus, I just showed you the councils. He's all God, all man. He's a styrofoam ball. Now you know Jesus isn't a styrofoam ball. It's an, it's an illustration. Somebody's going to go and say, Hey, Pastor Mark said Jesus was a styrofoam ball. Um, he is, he's half white and half black. He's white in his purity because he's all God. He's taken all of our sin. He who knew no sin took sin on himself. So when God looks on us, he looks through the righteousness of Christ. The sins absorbed to the light. And God only sees us as pure and righteous in Christ's name. That means none of the sins you've ever committed, right, even up until today or yesterday, God sees none of them. Because Jesus has made you right. Faith plus zero. Would you bow your heads with me tonight? Not so bad for not having all of our charts, huh? No, no, no. Listen, we give God the credit because he's the one that looks at us. So tonight, maybe you're listening on Facebook. Maybe you're listening around the world. Maybe you're just here listening. And you feel less than adequate. Man, welcome to humanity. Uh, you're a Christian and you feel less than adequate. Well, that's part of it. We think we have to do something. Now, I'm not telling you to sit on your hands and do nothing. Faith without works is dead. But don't think that those works do anything for you. Don't think you can climb a ladder to God. As soon as you got saved, you became righteous. You became the righteous of God. You are the sons and the daughters of God. When he looks at you, he smiles. When he looks at you, he says, man, that's my son, that's my daughter. Oh, but what about when I sin? Well, the great thing about God is when he looks through Christ, he doesn't see your sin. It's all absorbed. It's all forgotten. What does the Bible says? Cast it into the deepest sea. It's gone. As far as the east is from the west. He doesn't look at you. You look at you worse than God looks at you. You look at you in a bad way. Stop looking at yourself that way. Stop trying to earn something from God. Jesus earned it all, and he gave us a gift. Yesterday I was teaching, and I brought a stack of bills, and it was uh, wrapped together. And uh, I was talking from Proverbs about money. The Bible talks a lot about money. And I, uh, somebody, would, gangsters would say, I remember when I was a kid, gangsters would say, people in the mafia that I knew would say, hey, pinch me an inch. An inch of those bills, of $100 bills, is $23,200. So I had an inch. I had a $100 bill on the top and a $100 bill on the bottom. Never told them anything. I said, this is $23,200. Well, the people were like, really? And their eyes were fixated. And I put it on top of the pulpit. I talked about money. At the end of it, I, I said, I, I think I'd like to give this. I think I, I said to Cheryl before I did it, I'd like to give this away. And uh, she looked at me because I didn't tell her that, mo that moment either. In between those stack of bills, 100 on the top, 100 on the bottom, were $1 bills. It was about $300. But everybody was fixated on it. And I, and I could see. And I said, you know, Bible says wisdom. Bible says that wisdom is better than fine silver and gold. If I went out in the street and gave away $100 bills, I'd have a crowd. But the Bible says that wisdom is better than giving out gold. But if I went out in the street and said, hey, I'm giving out wisdom. Here's a scripture verse from Proverbs. <laughs> Not a whole lot of people would come around if I was downtown doing that. The truth is, it's hard for us to accept a gift that, doesn't, that, that we think we don't earn. And so the gift is Christ died for us. The gift is he died for your sins. Listen to this statement because it's a te theological statement. If you're saved tonight and you've accepted Christ as your Savior and Lord, he died for your sins past, your sins present, and your sins future. He died for them all. There's nothing you can do that's going to take you out of the graces of God. And there's nothing you can do that's going to put you further into the graces of God. It's a universal, unconditional love. It's the same. God's love doesn't vary. It doesn't go up and down because we do this or we don't do that. It's the same. So tonight, if you're feeling less than adequate, your head's bowed. 
Maybe you feel like you failed him. I'm not going to. I'm not going to embarrass you. Just raise your hand. And say, Pastor, that's me. I felt that way this very week. Come on, raise your hands. Raise them up high. Hands everywhere. Determine tonight not to feel that anymore. Accept the free gift that cost him everything. Just accept it tonight. He's accepting. You know what? If you don't accept that gift and you think you have to earn, then you're calling God a liar. You're saying, God, you don't love me enough unless I do this. Don't call God a liar. God loves you. Would you stand with me tonight? If you're here tonight and you don't know him as your Savior and Lord, maybe you think you've done too much for his, his love and his care. I'm going to ask you tonight to raise your hand saying, Pastor Mark, I want to dedicate my heart to God tonight. I don't want to take any. I want to hand over there. Where else? You raise your hand say, I want to dedicate my heart to God tonight. Another hand over there. I want you right now to come up here. I want you to stand up here with me. Come on. You raise your hand, stand up. Come up here. Be bold enough to come out of your seat and stand here tonight. Could you do that? That's a big call, isn't it? You raise your hand and say, I just want to rededicate myself. It's okay. We, I think we should do that. Come on. Just come up here right now and do that. And I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm just going to, I know you're in front of everybody, but trust me, all of heaven's watching. I just want you to come up. Thank you, Jesus. Come on up with me. And so tonight, there's some others that have raised their hands. I understand tonight, but listen, listen let's give the Lord a hand tonight. Would you bow and pray with me tonight? Would you bow and pray? Let's just pray right now. Pray for each other tonight. Would you do that? Just lift your voice to God and thank Him. Thank you, Lord. I just thank God. Okay, just continue to stay strong with Him, okay? You've got to. I'm so thankful to see you here tonight. Let me tell you something. He loves you. He saved you. And tonight is a difference for you. You know that, don't you? Yes, I do. Don't worry about what you've done, okay? Just try to live for Him, okay? I love you, man. Stay right here. Let's pray. Father, again, I thank you tonight, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord God, because you have made us righteous. Lord, we feel so many times that it's from the enemy that we're not, we're not good enough, Lord God. But you, through your Son, Father, have made us good enough. You have made us perfect, Lord God. It's his righteousness. Ours is but filthy rags. But when we step into Christ, if he be for us, we can't even be against ourselves. And we're thankful tonight, Lord God, that you have made us righteous. Lord, I pray for everyone within, within listening of my voice, Lord God, that they would realize even those people at home, Lord God, across the ocean, Lord God, over the world, they'd bow down on their knee right now and say, Jesus, I accept you. I want you in my life, Lord God, because I can't do this on my own. Only you can do it, Lord God. Lord, we mess up every day, but you have never messed up. You came, Jesus, all God, all man, and you were tempted in every area, and you never sinned, Lord God. And I'm thankful for that, because through that, you have made me righteous. Bless us now, Lord God. Bless our going in, our coming out, our rising up, our lying down, Lord God. Let us remember that we are the head, and we are not the tail. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a tonight. God bless you.